to go to the Forum of Trajan would have been a massive experience for any Roman. He would have entered the Basilica, the largest ever built in Rome of that type. The Basilica was revetted with marble, flooded with light. After that, you would have arrived in the square. You would have looked around and seen the monumental equestrian statue of Trajan. It really must have been an awesome sight. The Forum's centerpiece was a 125-foot marble column that towered above the new construction. That column still survives today. Around its facade, a spiraling relief is carved that tells the story of Trajan's invasion of Dacia. Trajan appears over and over and over and over again, uh, always involved in every aspect of the campaign, from its initial planning all the way through final conquest. And in this way, the column serves as a kind of uh, propaganda film. The column's exact height holds a more subtle significance. The height of Trajan's column itself, 100 feet, with the addition of the base and the statue on top of that, marked the height of the side of the Quirinal Hill, which was removed to create the forum at that spot. Therefore, it becomes a marker not only of the battles of Trajan, but also the battles of Apollodorus to clear the land and create this monumental urban space. Trajan's forum stood for 700 years. Most of it was reduced to rubble by a 9th century earthquake. But there is one surviving section that leaves no doubt about its imposing scale, a vast complex known as Trajan's Market. Apollodorus shored up the 125-foot cliff face he had created by form-fitting a six-story Roman shopping mall directly into the hillside. He ingeniously shaped the first three levels in a hemicycle, a semicircular structure with long, curved corridors of storefronts. The markets function to reinforce the hillside, which had just been carved out. And it's probably not um, by chance that the form that's used against that hillside is concave, therefore much stronger form again, the form of an arch turned on its side to resist the pressure of the hill beside that. Above the hemicycle were three more levels, with units ranging from small shops to great three-storied halls. Trajan's market contained over 150 individual storefronts that might have supplied everything from footwear to fine art. These markets must have sold uh, enormous quantities of materials from all parts of the Roman world and perhaps even beyond. While Trajan's Forum next door was a lavish haven for the city's elite, his market was engineered as a main street for the masses. The market, together with the Forum, represent two sides of Roman culture. The opulence of the Forum, its colonnaded forecourt, its uh, gilded decorations, uh, represented a tremendous formal center for the city. Right next to that, the brick architecture of the marketplace, very commonplace in the city for the daily lives of the Roman citizenry. Trajan's engineering feats at home and conquests abroad made him one of the most popular emperors in Roman history. By the end of his reign in 117 AD, the empire had reached its greatest size, stretching across the Middle East to the Persian Gulf. But defending more territory would prove problematic for Trajan's successor. So to stabilize the empire's borders, Rome's next emperor would build a massive barricade to seal off the Roman world from the barbarians beyond. By the time he died in 117 AD, Emperor Trajan had propelled the Roman Empire to the height of its size and wealth. But the drawbacks of such a widespread dominion would soon become evident. Trajan had no biological sons, so upon his death, control of the empire passed to his adoptive son, Hadrian. Hadrian, like Trajan, was a military man and an accomplished one. 
Hadrian saw that the empire would be unable to maintain its expanded borders. The longer the borders are extended, of course, the more money it takes to be able to maintain border defenses. So he wasn't looking for more things to conquer, but how to hold on to what they already had. Concrete evidence of Hadrian's defensive policy shift can be found today in a remote section of northern England, 1,500 miles from Rome. When Hadrian came to power in 117, the northern half of Britannia remained an untamed frontier, where Roman soldiers confronted the dual threats of freezing winters and barbarian incursion. So in 122 AD, Hadrian paid a personal visit to the front lines. The emperor quickly concluded that the only way to tame Britannia was to tame his own soldiers first. The Romans always believed it. You have this group of men who are serving the Roman state, make them work. If you're not disciplined, the thought is these Roman soldiers are just going to start frittering away their time and gambling and not doing the right thing. Hadrian put his legions to work on the most ambitious fortification ever conceived by a Roman. A towering 73-mile defensive wall across the entire country. Today, the pilfering of time has reduced Hadrian's wall to its foundations. But it once towered 15 feet high, with parapets rising an additional six feet above that. A nine-foot ditch was dug at its base, forcing potential invaders to make a 30-foot climb before coming face to face with the Roman legions on the other side. And if invaders did miraculously make it over the wall and pass the Roman guards, they had one last obstacle to slow their advance, the vallum, a 120-foot wide ditch that ran behind the wall from coast to coast. Hadrian's wall was as much a psychological barrier as a physical one. Its monstrous, unending facade served as an unnerving reminder of Rome's indisputable dominance. In some ways, you might be able to compare Hadrian's wall to the Berlin Wall. And that is a wall that's intended both to keep people out and to keep people in and to prevent a kind of uh, mixing that goes uncontrolled. Hadrian's Great Divide would be the Roman world's largest stone fortification. One made all the more challenging and effective by northern Britannia's jagged terrain. The engineers positioned the wall in as strategic a location as possible. It's often running along cliff edge, just above a drop to the north. But in principle, the natural geology of the landscape would, would help them build a bigger defensive structure. The main problem with that, from an engineering point of view, is the difficulty of getting materials to that site to build the wall. Three legions, totaling between 15 and 25,000 men, were needed to undertake the back-breaking task of moving heavy stone blocks to the construction site. But the wall was only one component of Hadrian's grand design. Every Roman mile, the legions built a guard post into the wall called a mile castle which housed up to 60 troops at a time. Between each mile castle stood two smaller watchtowers where sentries kept a constant eye on the borderland. 